Good afternoon, Gertens Gardeners. My name is Karen, and I'm coming to you from our beautiful northern lot, our nursery lot, on an absolutely stunning October afternoon. And I'm going to be talking to you today about winterizing your roses. Uh, here at Gertens, we have a lot of roses for sale. We get a lot of questions, particularly as the weather cools, about what you need to do to take care of your roses and how you can get them through our very tough, very extreme Minnesota winters. So we're here today. We're going to be chatting a little bit about hardy roses. We're going to be chatting a little bit about non-hardy roses, the differences in winterizing, and we're going to be taking questions from you today. So I'm excited to hear from all of you. If you do have a question on your rose care in general or winterizing specifically, please do hit us up right on the Facebook live feed. And I will be following the feed and answering questions after the video as well. So if you watch the whole video and you come up with something that you don't feel was answered, please feel free to add some comments down below and I will be getting back to you. So let's get started with our first question today. All right. Um, at what temperature do we need to get to before we start to cover our roses? So if you are interested in winterizing roses, what temperature do we need to be worried about before we start thinking about actually taking some steps to protect them from the winter cold? Well, the first thing is that roses are a lot tougher than we give them credit for. And if you have a couple nights of frost, you don't need to be panicking. Um, rose canes, mo even the most tender of our rose canes, and pardon us, we've got some, uh, some emergency services personnel in the background there. Um, even our most tender rose canes will still make it through freezing temperatures with no problem. So we're actually more worried about temperatures as they fall into the 20 degree mark than we are more the 32 degree mark, which we're going to be approaching here within the next couple of weeks in late October, early November. So what you really want to do before you take any steps to winter, winterize your roses is to allow them to approach and go into a state of semi-dormancy. And dormancy basically is just when the plants go to sleep for the winter. So what we want to see from our roses is we want to be, begin to see the leaves drying we want to see them dropping off and then we're going to at that point once the leaves are starting to fall off and the, the plant is no longer actively making chlorophyll it is not actively growing anymore that's when we can be get, when we can begin to winterize um, so that is really what you need to be looking for if we get some early snow no need to panic the roses will be just fine what are the differences between different rose types so here at Gertens, we sell two different main groups of roses, lots of different categories, but two kind of main groups if you want to think about it that way. We sell the hardy roses, which I still have blooming. You can see lots of blooms still at the end of October here in back of me. Um, and these guys will probably continue to bloom for some period of time, often into even November. I've had roses that have actually been blooming uh, the 1st of December and then they get snowed on. So uh, roses can actually bloom very late into the season. Um, and then you have the non-hardy roses. So those are the ones that folks come here to buy from us around Mother's Day. Those are our Grandiflora, Florabunda, and hybrid tea roses and those ones are not hardy here in Minnesota so those are the ones that you have to do a lot of work to try to get them through our very cold winters because they're simply not meant to grow here right so if you're buying something that's a hybrid tea it's probably going to be hardy to zone six or seven and that's down in areas like Kentucky and Missouri and that's about as far north as they really want to be without a lot of additional care so those are the ones that we really have to worry about taking a lot of steps to prepare for our winterizing whereas our hardy roses all of these guys that are standing behind me here you just let them bloom let them do their thing into late autumn and then as the real cold weather approaches we can take some extra steps just to make them nice and cozy and get ready for our winters um, I just bought and planted a Carefree Wonder rose. Does it need to be covered? So Carefree Wonder, along with many of our other hardy roses, is a zone four rose. It does not necessarily have to be covered like a hybrid tea would be. So if you're working with Carefree Wonder or any of the, of the um, zone hardy roses behind me, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to A, wait until the rose has approached a state of dormancy, right? So you're not going to be doing any of this yet. It's way too early. Um, you're going to wait until the leaves start to dry and crinkle and begin to fall off. Then you're going to be putting down a mulch layer. And I've picked up my very favorite mulch here. I'll hold this up for the camera. This is our Green Loon Western Red Cedar Mulch. 
and this is fantastic for the rose bed i use this all season round um, to protect my roses from insect pests to stabilize the moisture levels in my soil to prevent particularly in yucky droughty years like we had this year uh, prevent a lot of extra uh, evaporation of water out of my soil and then in the winter what i'm worried about is adding some extra mulch on top of my beds to give us that nice three to four inch layer so three to four inches is a big chunk right it's going to look like this you stick your finger in there your whole finger should be covered in mulch and you want a nice three to four inch layer at the base of each of your hardy roses and what that's going to do is that's going to insulate the bottom of the root zone from really cold temperatures if we have no snow cover in february which happens sometimes and it's also going to protect some of the bud um, at the base of the wood so that if you do have a lot of winter loss which sometimes happens in very very severe winters you have some of that bud wood that can come right back up and make you all new cane the next year so really with hardy roses like carefree wonder all you have to do is just keep watering wait until the rose goes dormant put down your mulch layer and then as an extra step if you do have rabbits or other chewing animals that are attacking your rose cane in the winter provide a barrier of some sort around your roses to keep them from eating the cane another question is how does the western red cedar mulch protect from insects specifically yeah so with rest western red cedar it is the same type of cedar that we build our cedar chests out of so um, cedars are the junipers and arborvitae families and both red and white cedars have cedar oil in them and that cedar oil it acts as basically nature's insect repellent and you know you probably remember tales of grandma and great grandma putting her very delicate linens inside a cedar chest to protect them from moths eating the linens and making holes in them well that same process works great in our garden beds so the cedar oil inside the the bark and the uh, wood of the cedar trees is ground up for our mulch and it has all the wonderful moisture retaining properties that all of our other wood mulches do but because it has that cedar oil in it it repels a lot of soft bodied insect pests so things like um, garden aphids uh, a lot of different kinds of mites spider mites uh, scale mealybugs all those things that are really yucky that can get into your roses and eat them are going to be repelled by the red cedar mulch and in fact i have not had any of those insect pests in my gardens since i began using red cedar so i am a very strong believer in that type of mulch um, I, I make sure that all of my customers know if they're talking to me that this is what you should be using on your roses because it's a really, really easy way to discourage a lot of rose pests, not all of them. Uh, unfortunately, soft fly larvae, as well as um, our dreaded Japanese beetles, do not get deterred by that cedar oil. So you still will have a few insect pests to deal with, but you're not going to have the whole huge array of really nasty little friends trying to visit your garden if you've got red cedar down. Um, I've heard we should keep watering our roses until the ground freezes. How much water and how does that help? Yeah, so just like every other plant, as a rose is going into a semi-dormant state, it needs to stay hydrated. It needs to be stocking up on its winter water reserves so that it doesn't dry out and all those tissues and cells get desiccated and that's really where our winter burn comes from it's the drying out of the cells and the dying because they can't access water anymore so it's very important that we properly hydrate all of our shrubs in the autumn until the ground freezes solid and if you were to turn on the hose then you'd be making ice instead of actually watering and permeating that ground with more moisture so what i do with my rose beds and it's the same thing this time of year as it is any other time of year when i need to water i'll go out i'll check the soil moisture levels by sticking my finger past the mulch into the soil if my finger is dry i know it's time to water if my finger comes out moist I can leave it alone, I don't need to water. And then what I'll do is I'm going to turn on my faucet, which is connected to my drip lines and soaker hoses, and I'm going to leave those on for about an hour. And what that does is it slowly permeates the water right at the root level, it keeps my leaves nice and dry so they're not picking up any fungal diseases. Very common this type of year, time of year to have a lot of leaf spotting and stuff as the leaves are aging. And that's okay, because they've pretty much done their job for the year. But you really want to make sure you're leaving that soaker hose on for a nice long one hour period because it's really going to give you a nice deep soak right at the root level where the roses need it most. And then you won't have to rewater again and again and again uh, quickly together. 
Um, can we still plant roses? If so, what are the extras we should do to help them? Yeah, so we absolutely can plant roses. And excuse me while I have a quick drink of water here. Just like roses, I need water too. Um, so if you are going to be planting roses, I brought some late autumn tools that you definitely do not want to be without. This is a great time of year to be planting your deciduous trees and shrubs. That includes roses. So deciduous is anything that drops its leaves in the autumn, <coughs> not evergreens. Evergreens, pretty much planting is almost done for the year. But really, you can keep going with your deciduous plants for a while. And what you want to do when you get your deciduous plants like roses into the ground, you want to encourage a lot of root growth. So we have two things that can help us do that right here. I have my Fertilome Root Stimulator, which any of you who have watched me do videos in the past have heard me sing the praises of Root Stimulator. It does exactly what the name says. It's a hormone which stimulates root growth, which is very, very important for plants that are getting in the ground this time of year because they have such a short period of time to pick up all that water, get their little rootlets into the ground, get growing, and get ready for winter. So we wanna make sure that we're getting lots and lots of root development as late into the year as we can. So make sure you're using this once every two to three weeks until the ground freezes. At the same time, I want you to be thinking about grabbing yourself some mycorrhizae. So I have both the tree and shrub, as well as the flower and vegetable mycorrhizae. Um, if you are purchasing your plants here at Gertens, make sure you buy the green tree and shrub mycorrhizae. Um, both of these mycorrhizae will bond to roses. They both have the correct type of fungi in them um, that will bond to the rose roots. But the green one here, if you're buying a brand new rose right now, this gives you a five year warranty on the life of your rose. So that is a pretty darn good deal. Note, it's very important, this is only on hardy roses, okay? Do not come in and buy a Mother's Day rose for your mom and it's a hybrid tea and then you expect it to live five years if you pop it in the ground. Those roses don't have year-long warranty, so this only works with our hardy plants, but it's a fantastic product. And what happens, those of you who have watched my video before have probably heard me say this before, um, the mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus. It attaches to the roots of the plant and extends the feeder root network via hyphae of the fungus out so that the plant that you've planted with the mycorrhizae has more access to nutrition, more access to vital nutrient, more access to water, all of the good things the plants need to be healthy and successful, the mycorrhizae help them get. So instead of having to throw down a bunch of fertilizer because your rose is not getting what it needs from the soil, you put in mycorrhizae and the rose is able via the fungus that's helping it out because uh, mycorrhizae is a good friend. It helps you find all the things you need in life. The mycorrhizae actually helps the roses find the phosphorus and the nitrogen that's already there in our soil. We have a lot of native phosphorus in our soil here in Minnesota and these products will help your plants take better use of what they have already there ready for them. Should I use a dormant spray on my grandiflora roses or any other type of roses? So dormant spray is a fantastic product. It can take out things like mite infestations. It can take out um, dormant spores of bad fungus. Unlike our mycorrhizae, not all fungus is good for our plants. Um, some cause leaf spots and diseases as well as cankers and lesions on our roses. And the best time to apply for the most part with a dormant oil is going to be very, very late in the winter because oil, like any substance, can wear off of the cane. And so you're going to, generally speaking, especially on your hardy roses, going to be applying that probably in March, probably late March, right before things start to warm up. And that's going to kind of take care of the rose cane. It's going to take care of any fungal spores in the area. However, uh, we're going to talk about some non-hardy rose care here in a second. And if you are doing the Minnesota tip method, uh, you may want to put a little dormant oil or a sulfur powder on your roses before you tip them into the ground because they are going to be basically covered in dirt for a whole long period of time. And you want to kind of kill anything that's sitting in the dirt with them essentially. So we'll talk about the Minnesota tip method here in a minute or two. Um, but yeah, you don't want to be using your dormant oil on your freestanding, regularly planted hardy shrubs until late, late in the season. Okay to use it though if you're doing the Minnesota tip. All right, 
Do you want to just explain the Minnesota tip method right now? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about things that we can do to help care for our non-hardy roses. So we have a lot of people who are really big fans of the what I call exhibition class roses. The roses that you're probably going to see if you go to an American Rose Society or Twin Cities Rose Club show in June. Uh, those include our Florabundas, our Grandifloras, and our Hybrid Teas, and they have that kind of classic florist rose look to them with the very high pointed tightly curled petals they usually don't open fully um, very very popular with a lot of gardeners but they are not hardy here so they're very difficult to care for uh, they tend to pick up a lot of fungal diseases and they tend to be really really difficult to get through our very tough winters because they're not made to grow here we're trying to grow things that don't want to live in our cold winters so how do you get them through the cold winters? Well, one thing that you can do is you can grow them in pots and keep them in their pot all year long. And if you do that, like many Minnesotans do, it's a very easy way to kind of care for your more exhibition class non-hardy roses, is you're going to keep your pots out until mid-November. The roses go to sleep, they start to lose their leaves, just like these roses will do in your garden. And then you're going to take your pot, you're going to water it really, really well, and you're going to move it into the garage. And it's going to stay in the garage for the entirety of the winter. You're going to take some snow, some snow, you're going to shovel the snow on there a couple times a month. You're going to provide gentle um, moisture to the rose so that as the pot warms, because the garage is, you know, maybe it's cold, but it's not horribly cold that water will melt into the pot and keep the rose hydrated. The snow also helps to insulate the root zone for days when it's really, really cold outside. So keep remembering to throw some snow on your pots inside the garage. And then when the weather warms back up in April, bring them on out and enjoy them. They're gonna start leafing out early. You're gonna get roses early. It's a really, really nice and easy way to overwinter your roses. Um, but the Minnesota tip is probably the most classic and it actually was developed here in Minnesota by fanciers of our exhibition class roses. And basically what you're going to do is you are going to trim down your rose. So step one, you're going to take your bypass pruners like this little pair of Coronas that I have here. Now usually I'm using Felco's but Corona is a fantastic brand as well. Uh, but you want to make sure that you have a bypass pruner. So you can see the action on the pruner here. It actually bypasses, the blades pass by each other. So they snip right next to each other. And this is a better way to take care of your rose canes than a traditional scissor cut, which can crush the cane between the two blades. The bypass just makes a nice clean cut, preserves the tissues at the end of the cut. It's much safer for your roses. So you're going to take your, your bypass pruner. You're going to trim your canes down. Uh, most people go to about 2 feet to 18 inches on a Minnesota tip just because it's easier to dig a hole that big rather than trying to go three, three and a half feet long. Uh, but if you have the room and you really feel like doing it, you can preserve most of your cane. Just cut the tips off and then you're going to remove any of the leaves that are still on the cane after it goes dormant. Sometimes stuff hangs on. Make sure you have your rose gauntlets on. I always uh, want to make sure that people understand you need to have gloves when you're working with roses folks please get yourself a good pair of gauntlets um, and if you're not going to wear gauntlets at the very least wear leather uh, jacket and really good leather base gloves because roses um, like anything else that lives outside can have germs on them and if you get pricked by a thorn that can get infected it can also give you tetanus so be very careful when you're handling your roses be smart and thoughtful about your protecting yourself while you're working with your roses um, so make sure you're wearing your gloves and you're going to trim down your cane you're going to get rid of it and put the rest of it in the compost and then what you're going to do is you're going to dig a big trough right in front of the rose you're going to water the root system really well. You're going to put a garden fork in the whole, kind of next to the rose in the back of the rose, and you're going to tip the whole thing up and you're going to lay it right down in that trough. Okay, so we're tipping the rose and we're laying it down into that trough. Then we're going to take all the soil that we just dug out of the hole and we're going to lay that right over the rose so that none of the rose is exposed because again, Roses that are not hardy here cannot live in our really deep freeze conditions. So we're using the soil as an insulator. It's basically going to do all of the protection work for us. And then once we've got our soil back filled in, we're going to probably hill that, that Minnesota tip trough over with some hay or some straw um, or some other kind of insulate. Pine needle works good. 
and you're just going to kind of make it nice and tight so that it lays down you got a nice little hump where your rose is and then as the weather warms again in the spring you're going to dig that all up you're going to tip her back where she belongs you're going to water 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 you're going to put a little root stimulator down to take care of any damage that was caused by moving the root ball around um, and then away we go rock and roll for the next spring how do you bend over the rose bush without breaking it or any root so that is where we want to make sure, number one, we've watered well. And number two, we're using our garden fork to pop the root up and lay the rose down. So we're not trying to essentially take a rose that is growing straight and bending it over. Although you can do that a little bit with something like a climbing rose, where you're essentially just taking it down off of its structure and then gently laying the cane down so you kind of have an arc. Um, that's really, really good with roses that are like zone five hardy like they're kind of hardy but not like the best hardiness so that you're getting some of those really delicate tips down on the ground and then you can mound that over with leaves and things but with a true minnesota tip you're actually going to dig the whole thing you're going to lift that root ball up you're going to tip the whole thing over so instead of going like this you're going to go like this um do rose cones work Rose cones are definitely a tool that some gardeners will utilize here in Minnesota to provide some insulation and protection on their roses. You do not need them with your hardy roses, so don't use them if you've got hardy roses in the garden. But if you have non-hardy roses and you prefer A, not to tip, and B, not to put them in the garage, you can try a rose cone. What I recommend for anybody who wants to do rose cones is A, take your bypass pruners again in November, trim your rose down so that it can be smaller than the cone that you're utilizing. Um, then you're going to tie the branches, the cane of the rose together with twine so that it's kind of compact. You're going to stuff the rose with hay before you put the cane on because again, just throwing a cone on there and calling it a day is not going to give you the insulation you need. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're mounding your mulch over the base of the rose. You're gonna make sure you're putting some straw or some winter, some leaves, fallen leaves on your rose nice nice insulation then you're going to use a rose cone that has holes on the top to allow wind to go through to allow some snow to get in there because again we do not want to create a desert for our rose they need that moisture they need that airflow that's really important to their health even when they're in a state of semi-dormancy through the winter so roses don't actually go fully dormant like some of our of our shrubs out here will they'll go completely to sleep roses actually stay in a state of semi-dormancy so they're not going to be completely dormant they're not going to be completely asleep there's still some vascular action going on in those canes and that is really what can get uh, nailed by those high winds and the heavy heavy cold that we get in february can i wrap my roses in burlap you can wrap your roses in burlap and landscape fabric. And in fact, I do that at home. So I have a garden of over 60, mostly antique, hardy roses. I only have one hybrid tea. Um, and that one does get mounded. I just, it looks like a mountain <laughs> when I'm done with it at the end of the year. Uh, and then what I'll do with my roses, anything that is younger than about three years old is going to get wrapped in fabric, whether it's burlap or landscape fabric, because those young tender rose canes are the, one of my rabbits in the area's favorite foods to eat in the winter. And with a lot of antique roses, a lot of species roses, if you grow things like that, like I do, uh, they bloom once in the spring. And so if the rabbits come through and they chew all the cane down to the ground, the rose will be fine. It will live, it will come back. So don't panic if you do take some rabbit damage over the winter. However, I lose all my winter, uh, my blooms in June. So it's a real big bummer to have a ro uh, rose that you've been looking at and it's been growing great and it has all this height and it's looking beautiful. Year two, it's really starting to hit its stride. And then Mr. Rabbit comes through and he eats all the canes down and you're left with a rose this big. Uh, that is just a heartbreaking situation. So I always recommend for folks who have their hardy roses out, but you've got rabbits in the area or maybe even deer. Sometimes deer will take down rose cane too. Um, they're looking for nutrition, they're starving, they'll take what they can find. So make sure you're wrapping your canes up in um, burlap or using some landscape fabric, or you can use chicken wire as a caging. We even have rabbit cages that are pre-made for you. You just pop that sucker right over your rose and it protects the entire base of the rose from getting nibbled by those rabbits. 
what does winter kill look like on rose bushes? And is there anything I can do after I find it? Yeah, so winter kill is something that you're probably not going to know for sure you have until the roses break dormancy in the springtime. So I always tell folks, you know, things are going to start to wake up in April. We're gonna have a nice warm spring, hopefully coming in 2022 again. And we're going to begin to see our shrubs starting to break dormancy. They're, the leaf buds are going to go from hard and kind of brown colored to soft green and they're going to swell and swell and they're going to start to make leaves and that's what's known as breaking dormancy because the plant isn't dormant anymore it's starting to grow so that's what we want to when we want to get out into our gardens we want to begin assessing our trees and our shrubs for any winter kill and it's not just roses any tree any shrub can have winter kill if it's been a tough winter so you want to make sure that you're checking all of your shrubs you're looking for areas where those little buds aren't swelling they're not getting bigger they're not starting to make leaves if you've got a section it's usually going to be from the top down not from the bottom up um, almost every shrub it's sending the energy from the root up into the tips and it's a slow process it's not a day process it's going to take a little bit and you're going to start to see the leaves on the bottom swelling first and at the tips swelling latest so you again want to be a little reserved because you may still have some growth happening that you weren't sure about a, a week earlier um, but what you can do is you can take your bypass pruners and you can do what i call a test cut so on roses you're going to look for the little swelled section and you're going to take your bypass printer and you're just going to snip about a quarter of an inch above that leaf bud that's growing and you can take your little cane and you can look at the end and if it has a green circle on the inside that is living tissue you are good to go you don't need to cut any more um, if you look on the inside and there's just brown and there is no green to be found anywhere you need to keep trimming down because you've still got some dead wood that you have to take out and that's the same for any shrub that um, that green layer on the inside underneath your shrub's bark whether it's a rose or a viburnum or a lilac or whatever um, is always going to have that little green ring of life underneath if it's live wood if it's good wood and if you see green you let it go if you see brown take it down what rose types don't need special protection for winter so as we discussed before any of our hardy roses here probably won't need much protection at all just that mulch layer and if you have rabbits or other browsing animals in the area in the winter time again some protection for your younger plants to keep them from being eaten generally as roses age they get really thick and tough and animals don't find them as tasty and they're less likely to try to chomp on them um, but particularly your first three to four years after you've planted your plant, you're going to want to provide some winter protection from feeding issues, not necessarily winter kill. Um, and then basically anything in here that you've bought will probably not need a ton of winter protection. But if you're really worried about it, or perhaps you live farther up in northern Minnesota and you, instead of being here in zone 4B, you're up in zone 3B, like up in Duluth, it's a little bit colder up there. <coughs> Be sure to look at buying some of our Canadian bred roses. So we have roses that were bred up in Canada, things like Oscar Peterson, Champlain. Um, all of these are gorgeous, really, really hardy roses that are hardy to zone three. So they're really tough. They weather the winter just beautifully. They pop right into dormancy, out of dormancy in the springtime. You barely ever have to trim any winter kill off of them at all they just weather phenomenally phenomenally well so any ragosa roses any canadian bred roses if you're worried about trying to get roses through the winter those are the ones to start with should i leave the rose hips on the shrub yes absolutely leave your rose hips on the shrubs everybody they're so beautiful so for those who do not know rose hips are the fruiting body of the rose and we can take a look at my my little friend here <coughs> this is popcorn drift and if you look at uh here's a little rose bud here of popcorn drift and you can see this is the petal this is the part that we always pay attention to but this is not where the business happens okay all of the exciting stuff is actually happening in that little green ovary right underneath the petals and if this is pollinated and it becomes fruitful then this little guy will swell the petals will drop off and it'll become what we call a rose hip and that is the fruit of the rose so on roses that like to produce rose hips um, popcorn drift isn't one that is particularly great at at bearing babies 
Um, but that is basically the roses attempt at making baby roses. So if you have roses that are producing rose hips, the fruiting body, leave them be. Number one, they're gorgeous autumn color. Uh, so, so pretty oranges and yellows and reds. And if you ever have a chance to stop by Gertens uh, within the next couple of weeks, walk over to our pond area that's just back at the north end of our lot and you will see one of our species roses there. We have a Rosa Glauca and it is in full hip set right now. It is an amazing sight. Bright red berries everywhere and they look so beautiful. Um, for those of you who like to be a little canny in the kitchen, rose hips make fantastic jams and jellies. So if you, like me, like to make some, some jams or jellies or pies out of your garden bounty, feel free to pick your hips at maximum ripeness when they have reached their maximum color and are soft to the touch. They shouldn't be squishy soft, but they should have some give. Um, go ahead and harvest them and there are lots of recipes for rose hip jam and jelly on the internet but basically what you'll do is you'll clean out the inside put the fruit in hot water boil it down with some sugar and voila you got jam it's it's pretty easy stuff so uh, rose hip jams and jellies very high in vitamin c a very tasty treat for late autumn all right um i really like to plant rose bushes but i only get about five hours of light in that area is that, is that enough for roses or is there a specific kind of rose that would work there? Yeah, so if you do not have a full eight hours of sunshine, if you have a partial shade location, like a five hour, to, you know, four to five hour location, you can still grow roses. Um, roses are actually more tolerant of shade than we give them credit for and some are more tolerant than others. I probably would never put a hybrid tea or a grandiflora in a partial shade location. Those guys full sun or bust. But if you've got something like a Ragosa rose, some of the Canadian bread roses, some of our smaller, like little popcorn drift here, pretty tough little rose, very fragrant, very charming, especially in the autumn with all the flecking on the petals that it gets when the weather's cold. Um, these guys can take five hours of sun and they'll be fine. Now they may not be as plentiful blooms as you will get in like an eight to nine to 10 hour situation. But if they're getting five hours of sun, you will get some bloom on your rose. So it's absolutely possible to go into partial shade. All right, so that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And again, I know lots of you have lots of questions. So please feel free to leave even more questions on this Facebook feed of this Facebook Live video. I will be back with you to answer any questions that you guys may have. And always feel free to come on into Gertens, ask for Karen, I'm here to help. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a fantastic Gerton Gardener's Day.